Welcome to Dead Headspace, a part of Silver Shamrock's HorrorCast, a podcast network that includes Killing Time with Silver Shamrock and Unburying the Dead, where we exhume classic horror paperbacks for the new generation. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today we're talking with the author of The Dark Tower Companion, the Stephen King Illustrated Companion, and... Dissonant Harmonies, amongst many, many others. Bev Vincent, say hi, Bev. Hello, hello, everybody. Now, let's just jump right into it. What got you into horror? Um, I would have to put the blame on this um, not very well-known writer, guy named King. Um, back in the uh, late 70s, my first year at university, I went to a used bookstore every Saturday. It was just part of my routine. And at the time, I was reading mostly science fiction and fantasy. Mm. Um, you know, Heinlein and uh, people of that type. And I just saw this book on an end cap in this very quaint old used bookstore that rang a bell. I remember people having mentioned it. Um, didn't know much about it, but it was, had this cool black cover with this drop of blood at the corner of the character's mouth. And I thought, oh, okay. And there was this wasn't like a big eureka moment or anything. I just added it to the stack. Um, so when I eventually got around to reading Salem's Lot, I was thinking, hey, this guy is really good. I wonder what else he's written. And that was the beginning, really, for me. Um, I went and found everything that he had uh, up to that point, which in 1979, there wasn't that much out. Uh, so it was easy for me to catch up. Um, Night Shift really captivated me because I love those short stories. And that was when I really began dabbling in writing, too, because I wanted to write stuff like that as well. That's a, that's fantastic. Night Shift was my, my introduction to, uh, to King, and I, I fell in love with those stories. That's probably... To this day, my favorite collection by him. Brendan. What uh, what about you, man? What was your first uh, King? Was it a collection or a novel? You know what? My first King was uh, the Gunslinger. Um, oh, okay. I I had heard, and 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 I was relatively late to the game. I think I read it first the first time when I was about twenty one. I heard they were uh, making a movie or a series about it maybe the first time around well probably not even close to the first time around but one of the times they were taking a crack at that uh probably about 20 years ago 15 20 years ago and i said that sounds interesting and i i blew through it a couple days went on to the next one and you know in two months i'd read the whole series that was out and uh wind through the keyhole came out maybe uh, a couple years after that but uh yeah, that's my long-winded answer. Um, and, you know, never looked back what a, what, a, what a series The Dark Tower is. So, you know, Bev, that was your, let's call it your introduction to horror. What other authors did you, you know, because you, you didn't have a ton to work through in the late 1970s, what other authors, once you'd kind of completed the King collection, caught your attention? Well, I, I guess I'd have to backtrack a little bit and say that really my introduction to horror was Poe. Um, I bought this dollar paperback when my family was on vacation when I was maybe about nine or ten, Tales of Mystery and Imagination. And uh, I read the binding off that one. I love that one, too. But, um, you know, all the usual suspects, um, Dean Koontz, of course, um, uh, you know, Ramsey Campbell. Um, and and when, when Dance Macabre came out, that was like my reading list uh, and not only reading list movie list he had those recommended lists at the back of you know about 100 or 150 books and movies and when dance macabre came out that was around the time when vcrs came out as well and so all of the horror movies that i'd never had a chance to see because i grew up in a small community where we had two tv stations and they never played anything like that so we really, in university, living in the dorm, we did a deep dive into all of that stuff, renting all that stuff every weekend. And uh, really, that was my education in horror. You know, Dawn of the Dead, uh, you know. Thomas Macabre really broadened my horizons, I would say, in, in, in both uh, literature and, uh, and movies. You know, Peter Straub was always an early one, too. I remember picking up a copy of Ghost Story in a convenience store late one night, and that was my start with him. But what I find is interesting is, 
you know, we're talking about what was your first king? And I think you can ask that question to a lot of people and they'll have an answer. Yeah. Where there's lots of other writers where I'm not sure what my first book with them was. I mean, I do know Ghost Story for Straub, but for many others, I don't remember what the first one was. But for King, that always seems to be something that uh, sticks in people's minds. Now, just to piggyback on that comment, Bev, this is the 90th recorded episode. Um, there's been quite a few episodes where there's been multiple guests for like round tables and such. And uh, I don't even think this is hyperbole. At minimum, eight out of ten guests, but I want to say nine. They started with King. He's influenced so many generations. And I never thought about Dance Macabre um, in this sense before, but he he hasn't changed with being the guy that recommends new uh, creators of the horror genre to people. Um, Dance Macabre, I, I really enjoyed that book, too. Um, I didn't know about Jack Finney. I, I, I wasn't aware that he was a guy of uh, the Body Snatchers. I just didn't put two and two together, but... Yeah, he introduced me to, I think it's time and time again. Time and time again, or, or time after time. Yeah. So, something like yeah. that. Um, yeah, so, Brennan, I kind of want to reel it back to Bev's early days in his writing career. Is there anything that you want to touch on before we move forward? And se- semi-related to moving in that direction, uh, you know, you mentioned that before you, you know, early 1970s, your uh, big things were fantasy and science fiction. Uh, but, you know, you're primarily known for dabbling in the horror genre now. What is it about that genre that, you know, said, this is for me? Um, you know, to, to create really good science fiction and fantasy, you have to build worlds, which is a daunting thing, especially for somebody just starting out, mm. where horror is primarily set in the world everybody knows. Uh, I could set a horror story in the paper mill where I worked in the summer, and I didn't have to build any worlds. I just had to recreate the world that I already knew. Um, and, you know, over the years, I have done a little bit in the science fiction fantasy realm in terms of my writing, but I'm more grounded in uh, the familiar world and for me, that's just easier to wrap my mind around. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, I didn't know this about you until recently, but you went to college, to you got a PhD in chemistry. True. And looking at your bibliography, and it was, uh, I don't I don't know if it's out yet or not, but there was this uh, novel you and Brian were working on where it touches on, I want to say, like, quantum physics and uh, black holes. Is that is that anywhere close to correct? So the, the book that uh, Brian uh, Keen and I did together is called Dissonant Harmonies, and it's two novellas. We each wrote a separate piece for that. And Brian's has something to do with what's known as the Mandela effect. Mm, okay. And that's, um, it, it's a phenomenon of false memories, and large groups of people think that they remember something that happened, and the Mandela in it is Nelson Mandela. Mm. And there are a lot of people who believe that Nelson Mandela died in prison. It's like a collective false memory. And so that's what's behind Brian's story in that collection. Oh, that's interesting. Well, why don't we talk about your story then? Okay, so mine is called The Dead of Winter. So Dissonant Harmonies is a project that Brian and I have been talking about for eh, probably 14 years We when we first uh, bandied the idea about it. And it came about because we talked about the fact that we like to listen to music when we write. And we would compare notes. What types of music do you listen to? And we found found out over the years that we have a lot of similarities, but we also have a lot of dissimilarities. And so we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we each made a music playlist for the other person to listen to exclusively while they're working on a novella? And, you know, the idea kept coming back and forth. I think originally we were going to do a short story collection, but then we decided let, we'll do it just a single piece each. And so I put together my playlist for Brian, you know, about an, a CD's length, about an hour's worth of music, and he put one together for me. And when we were working on these stories, that's all we listened to. We weren't necessarily 
you know, writing about the songs. We just wanted to see what the influence of the music on us as writers. So my story is called The Dead of Winter, and it's a, a horror novella set in the winter in Rhode Island. And it's about two brothers. It's a little bit of a prodigal son uh, reversal. So the older, more respectable brother had, has left the small town and made something of himself as a police officer. The younger brother stayed behind, and he's he's a druggy goof, goofball. And the older brother comes back to visit because one of his former girlfriends has gone missing. And the girl's mother has asked the older brother to come back and maybe jumpstart the investigation. And in the course of the investigation, they find some very, very strange things happening uh, underneath this small town uh, that, that's... Uh, in a nutshell, that's sort of what the story is. Mm. And but it takes place during a blizzard too, so the whole town is essentially shut down during a blizzard. Isolation. That's like the yeah. that's one of the biggest components for horror. That's brilliant, man. And that real quick before Brian jumps in, I just got a comment on the cover. I, I love it. It reminds me of Robert Block's uh, Psycho. Um, <laughs> in, in every complimentary way that I can mean that. Uh, Brian's story is called The Motel at the End of the World, and that's sort of the the touch point that the artist used for that uh, cover. Very cool. I, I thought it was such an interesting idea to kind of build the playlists and switch them with each other. What uh, I don't know if you guys had this in mind, but what I immediately thought of is, um, I, I don't know how much it's done anymore, but you used to see two bands uh, kind of collaborate and make a split EP, and they would uh, kind of do their own approaches, cover each other's songs. Um, to a degree, I, I almost feel like that's what you guys are, are doing. Like, if, if, you know, I took someone else's writing music, it, it almost seems uh, like their style, to a degree, might kind of creep into what I'm working on. So I, I'm wondering, when you created your playlist for Brian, how much of it was just, this is what, uh, this is what I like, and how much was maybe a challenge to him? I think there's a... a an element of both um i picked some songs by artists that i knew brian listened to but i went for deep cuts things that i knew about that i thought maybe he hadn't heard and then the other component of it was i picked some musical groups and musicians who i was pretty darn sure brian never listened to <laughs> Uh, you know, the, so you know the the things that we knew we both liked: Super Tramp, Alan Parsons Project, things like that. But the things that I picked out that I thought he'd never listened to were more techno, electronic music. So Spongle was one of the ones that I picked for him. Um, and so my selection was not really thematic so much as I want to just sort of give Brian things that he probably hasn't heard before. Brian's selections for me were a little bit more geared towards uh, mood. And so there, there's definitely uh, like a progression and a, a theme to what he picked for me. And I have to say that he picked a lot of things that I don't normally listen to. <laughs> uh, and and you know, somebody asked me recently, oh, what, what, what was the worst song that he picked that you had to listen to? Um, he, he challenged me. I mean, there, there were things like Johnny Cash, who I've listened to, and, uh, you know, uh, Bob Dylan. But uh, Nine Inch Nails is not on my normal playlist, although I do like their instrumental. They've done some of these ghost uh, releases, which I like listening to. But yeah. Um, so, but the interesting thing is, you know, somebody asked me, you know, of all the songs, which one would you latch onto to say this one influenced what you were working on the most? And I really can't say that there's one that was, or any combination of them that really had a direct influence on my novella. It's it was just mood, completely mood. And I find often when I listen to music when I'm writing, I can sort of go into a zone and miss entire songs or albums. I, they're playing in the background and they're clearly registering at some level, but I could not conscious. I'll, I'll, I'll surprise myself and say, Oh, you know, I, I missed that song. I really liked I have to back up and listen to it again. So what was, 
Did you have one band or artist that you really stuck to more than any others that you gave to him? No, there was uh, 16 different ones. Uh, okay. Everyone was by a different uh, different band or performer. And, and we put together a Spotify playlist um, that combines all of our songs. So people who are interested can go to my website and you can listen to the, the inspiration music. BevVincent.com? BevVincent.com. All right, we'll have that in the show notes. Brennan, you got anything else on this subject? Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm curious. The, uh, you don't have an issue writing to music that has lyrics? That's not something that affects you? It depends what I'm doing. If I'm writing, writing, then I don't have an issue with that. If I'm editing, then I really need just instrumental. Um, but yeah, if, if I'm doing first draft writing, then I can be listening to anything. I wrote an entire album listening to nothing but Super Tramp's double live album over and over and over again. It was just, that was the zone I was in. Now, when you're selecting music for yourself, as opposed to uh, letting Brian Keane do it for you, <laughs> uh, which just seems like an adventure, uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have, the, do you find that the music dictates what you write, or do you have to like kind of carefully curate what you pick? Like, I'm writing something that's, you know, psychological, maybe a little bit more quiet, and, you know, I can't have something blaring in the background. Maybe sometimes, but generally, now I'm, I'm very much a, an album-oriented rock kind of guy. Uh, I don't do song playlists as a rule. I listen to entire albums. Um, and so, you know, given any particular album, there's going to be a wide variety of, you know, up-tempo, down-tempo, fast, loud, quiet, so not really. Um, the music is just there. Primarily for me, the music's there to obscure everything else. And so I mean, when I first started writing, I had a small child in the house. And uh, you know, there would be little noises around that might be distractions. The music creates this wall of sound that is like the new threshold. And everything else sort of falls away into the background. That's I see. You no, know, I have, I have the complete opposite experience. I can't have anything going. I, you know, I love to listen to music to kind of get myself into a good mindset. But then once I and and writing or editing does not matter. I I, I gotta have silence or you know I can't focus on it. <laughs> um, and I think part of it is just the fact that I'm a musician. So I think that the instrumental portions of it. Uh, register in you know the same way that lyrics might register with somebody else. But Patrick, what about you? Without music, the birds chirping outside my window would be a distraction. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually yeah, it's a good. Um, yeah, so it depends. Honestly, it's like a day to day thing. I mean, sometimes I can listen to uh, vocals and it depends on the mood i'm in uh which uh, dictates the song or whatever uh, i do like um soundtracks uh to like video games or like the last of us has a really good soundtrack um i like john carpenter's uh lost themes uh albums so it's pretty awesome those i kind of go to those a lot the instrumental uh, uh scores to movies and whatnot um bev i would love to talk about if you recall, not necessarily your first story, but your first publication, what that process was like. And uh, I'm actually not sure what year that was. So if anything you can tell us about that, I'd be real interested in hearing. Yeah, so I, I wrote probably 20 or so short stories when I was an undergrad. And I never did anything with them. I just wrote them and I read them to my, you know, people who lived on the floor in the in the dorm but uh, I never ever submitted them anywhere. And then once I got into grad school, I didn't have as much time for that. And then I sort of went into postdoc and you know, the, the, the fiction writing took the back seat to the scientific writing. And around about 1999, um, I went to a, a local writer's guild, had a conference. And my main reason for going was because Joe Lansdale was gonna be there. Uh, Joe just lives, you know, 80 or 90 miles up the road from me. And uh, he just sat there and told us stories. He didn't read anything. He just sat there and regaled us with some of the funniest damn stories I've ever heard. And I was 
inspired to get back to writing again. And so this would be about 1999. And I set myself a goal to see if I could get something published by the end of the year. And so I submitted a, a few stories around and I got an acceptance letter to this magazine down in Australia it's called the Wine Dark Sea. They had only published one issue of their magazine and I was accepted for issue two. We went through all the editorial rounds, everything was fine, and then they just disappeared off the face of the planet. And issue two never came out. Um, so I regrouped and I sent a story in. Um, it was an online publication, which in 1999 was not that popular a thing, called The Harrow. And they had a Halloween contest. And I wrote this story called Harming Obsession, which is an obsessive compulsive disorder where people are almost paralyzed because they think that they've done something to hurt somebody, especially manifests when they're driving. They're sure that they've run somebody over or bumped into something and they always have to stop and check. Oh my God. And so I put, I, I'd seen this um, 60 Minutes or you know, 2020 uh, piece on it and I was inspired to so take a guy like that and put him in a car and send him out to pick up some more candy on Halloween night when all sorts of kids are all over the place. <laughs> and, and so he's just, you know, he's got the short drive, but he just is constantly thinking he's hit somebody. So the Harming Obsession won that contest. Um, I got $50 for my very first short story, and nice. I think it was published in early 2000. And that was the beginning. That, oh my God, Do you, where can I find that, man? That sounds like an incredible story. Um. I, you know, if, if you go into the Wayback Machine, you can probably find the original publication, but it's been in, um, uh, Cemetery Dance published it. Uh, actually, if, if you go to my website and look at the fiction link, um, it, it's probably one of my most reprinted stories. Um, it, it's maybe in a best of Cemetery Dance. There was an audio version of it and that, so yeah, it, it's, it's had a lot of traction over the years. Very cool. Yeah, I, I definitely want to read that. What a great, especially ever since I became a dad. Like I, I wrote about the death of kids before, just because like that's the worst thing I could think of. But I keep writing about sons dying because I got a little boy now, and <laughs> just, I'm so interested yet so terrified to read that. But I, I, I'm gonna make sure to read that. Uh, just a real quick shout to Lansdale. He's like one of the coolest fucking guys, man. Him and Ronald Kelly are two for me and Brennan. They're like two of the coolest dudes from. The you know I'm just gonna call it the zebra era. Um, yeah. Real nice, sm smart as hell, funny as hell, and I don't know how they write so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Hap and Leonard stories are just, they just I fall off my chair <laughs> reading them. I mean there, there's, there's I think it's Two Bear Mambo that opens up with the you know uh, Leonard's burned down the crack house next door for the third time or something. <laughs> it's, it's just, it just slays me. Now, after that, was there a bug that planted when you got that acceptance? Was there a bug that just ate away and said, I got to keep doing this shit? Oh, definitely. <laughs> uh, my, my one issue at that time was that I didn't have a permanent place to write. I had a laptop computer that I kept in a carry bag. And anytime I wanted to write, I had to pull it out and find a place to set up and gather all my papers together. And so that year uh, at Christmas, my wife asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And I said, I'd like a place to write. And so she got me a roll top desk, which was the perfect solution because I could be as messy as I wanted to scatter my papers out. Uh, and at the end of the day, you pull the top down and it's this nice, you know, piece of furniture and it looks very presentable and it's not a disaster zone like my writing. Well, that was 20 years ago. My, my office, now I now have an office completely, and my office is a disaster zone. <laughs> the roll top doesn't roll down anymore and all that. But uh, that was really the kickstart. And then the second part was finding uh, a routine. Mm. And so I had, at that time, I had a, a nine year old daughter, mm -hmm. um, and my wife was also in school. Um, and so I wanted to find a time that didn't chew into family time. And I've always been a morning person. So I found that if I got up at five o'clock in the morning, I could have a 
good hour and a half to two hours of writing time before I had to transition to my day job. And that has been my routine ever since. I have done virtually everything that I've written in that two hour window every day. Yeah, so, you know, the more writers I listen to, especially the ones that, um, you know, seasoned, it it really kind of, I mean, it's different for everyone. Like, I know Don Winslow, I saw in an interview, he said he does 12 hours a day still. It's so crazy to me. But for the most part, from the authors I've heard, it's like you, two, Lansdale, three. It seems like if you have, I'm just throwing numbers out there, I don't know, three to four, maybe five hours a day, as opposed to, like, long hours, you're going to have a, funner, a more fun time and kind of keep on at it. I think the the well starts to run dry. I mean, I, I write on weekends too if if there's nothing else going on. And I can, you know, I can put in a good four or five hour session. But then I'm I'm done. I'm I'm burned creatively. I, I can do other things like proofreading or editing or you know, do some book reviews or something in nonfiction. But in terms of producing imaginary worlds and people, I think you need a little bit of recharge time. Brennan, I got one more question, and I've been hogging the air time too, uh, long enough, but um, I, I found before I had my kid, I'd write, I'd have some days, the whole day for myself, my wife's at work or whatever, and at the end of the day, my brain physically hurts. <laughs> That's not fun. I don't want to go back to that story. Yeah, um, and and I, I have had marathon writing sessions. Uh, my wife and I, uh, for our 10th anniversary, we rented a... Uh, a cottage down Surfside Beach, down the Gulf Coast from here. Okay. And she was working on something, writing a paper, I think, of her own at the time. And this was NaNoWriMo, so it was November. Mm. And I wrote 8,000 words in one day. Holy shit. Yeah, which was <laughs> oh like God. massive output, because I'm generally lucky if I get 1,500. And and over the, I think we were down there for maybe at least five days. I wrote half a novel in that short span of time but that's far far and few between it's it's not my normal uh, way of doing things yeah i was listening to an interview with uh keen and uh, david uh scow mm -hmm. and um they're just talking about writing a full-length novel a sixty thousand plus word in like four days or something crazy like that i i, I don't get it <laughs> uh, well i i wrote the dead of winter which is 40,000 words in a month. That's good, and that's, man. And that's a month of, you know, two-hour mornings. And, and I wrote it longhand. Oh, interesting. I, I had uh, one of those uh, Moleskine notebooks, and I, I wrote it longhand. And sometimes I wrote it at the kitchen table with my ear pods in listening to Brian's stuff. Sometimes I was over at the local bagel shop. This was back when you could actually go out into restaurants and things, you know. <laughs> um, but every morning. But yeah, so that was that was an immensely productive time, especially since I didn't have a friggin' clue where the story was going. There's something about writing in a notebook. Like, I write longhand um, with some stories, and there's just like... There it's a pain in the ass when you're, you there's no find a search bar or whatever but i don't know about you but there's just some satisfaction with writing in your notebook and a pen or pencil it it just feels like a closer connection um how do, is that something you do often longhand as opposed to um word processor that was really i mean i've, I've done it occasionally when i've been somewhere where i didn't have a computer um, but that was really the first time when I just consciously decided I wasn't going to work at the computer. And ever since then, virtually every first draft of anything I've done, fiction, has been that way. And when I'm, I, either when I'm finished a short story, or, or in the case of the novella, when I was maybe a third of the way through it, I dictate it into the computer. And the, the, the dictation software that's with Microsoft Word now is actually quite good. Uh, although you have to build in a rhythm because you not only have to read the words, you have to read the punctuation and the line breaks. And so you sort of get into a rhythm. Uh, you know, open quote, say the sentence, comma, close quote, new paragraph. But it's uh, it's it's your sort of first editing pass as you're reading it in. You're hearing how things sound. Uh, and that, of course, I have to go through and correct all the transcription errors because... There are certain words that always gets wrong. 
and I think my Canadian accent bugs it sometimes. <laughs> I, you know, I, I had read that, that you said that what you're doing nowadays is doing by longhand and then dictating it into the computer. Um, and I, I thought the idea of, you know, rhythm was so interesting to that because, you know, there's certainly when, when you're reading, when you're editing, when you're even reading back something that you just wrote, uh, and doing it out loud, you get that kind of sense of it. But when you're just reading straight through, not small chunks, uh, you get to kind of experience what the re the way the reader is going to experience it. So I'm kind of curious how your editing on the spot process goes with that, what you've kind of learned about your own writing with that. Uh, well, one of the things I learned was if you're going to read something into the computer for dictation purposes, you shouldn't read it the same way that you would read it if you were reading it to an audience. You don't get dramatic because the, you're not, the, the computer audience isn't impressed with your prose. Uh, and in fact, you can just confuse the hell out of it if you start doing all sorts of uh, you know, crescendos and the, the normal dramatics you would do. Yeah. Um, reading the, a story aloud was always part of my process, but it usually came later. Um, usually after I had written a few drafts and done some editing, and then I would read it at the end to sort of smooth out places where just where things feel clunky. Uh, you know, reading a story and, and reading it on the page and hearing it are not the same thing, of course. But there are certain things that you just know, if I'm stumbling over them when I'm reading them myself, the reader is probably going to have a hard time parsing exactly what I'm trying to say there, too. Um, but you also pick up things like, you know, is this, oh my God, this sentence is really long. You know, <laughs> I, I've run out of breath and, and I, this really needs to be broken up. Or places where you've really gone overboard with description or narrative when maybe dialogue would be better served and something like that. Um, I just finished a story for, um, it's actually, it's a, it's a gaming company uh, and they're launching a Kickstarter and they put out a call for stories in this futuristic, it's seven, uh, said it's seven, like 7,500 years in the future. And so they had this whole world Bible that we had to learn to write stories in their world. And the first draft that I did was really, really narrative heavy. And that was sort of the the feedback I got not only from reading it in, but from the the uh, editors was, you know, this this is like info dump. Uh, you really need to go back and uh, uh, you know turn these into scenes where people are doing things rather than sitting around ruminating about the details or what's what's happening or what's going to happen. So I mean, this this process is this something that you feel like is just working for you now or? Do you, you know, feel so good about it that this is kind of as far as the dictation software and it's being able to keep up with what you're doing, this is just what you'll be doing from now on? Um, not 100% not sold, but I think for short stories, it certainly will be. For longer things, like you said, there's no uh, search and find and replace. And if you forget what color a character's eyes are, um, of course, you can always just sort of put in a placeholder, but you like to get it right the first time through. And there, there's nothing uh, like being able to just jump back 100 pages and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy's name was Bill, not Bob. And <laughs> so for the novels, I think uh, I'll probably stick to uh, either Word or Scrivener. And I sort of every now and then I jump into Scrivener and give it a chance because it's really a, um, a writer's platform. It has places where you can plug in PDFs of your research and photographs and you can build storyboards. And so I like that, but I haven't really mastered it yet. Excellent. Patrick, um, I want to take us to, um, actually, I would like to take us to this book right here. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. That's a perfect Perfect time to plug. Well, I'm throwing it to you. We got plug David Scow in there too. Yep. <laughs> There's a lot of good names in here. So I just want everyone to know that from the day of this recording till this Thursday, you have a chance, audio listeners, of holding it up, courtesy of Richard Schismar of the Cemetery Dance Books that he graciously gave to us to give away to some of you listeners. Uh, we have a beautiful hardcover of Flight or Fright edited 
by our friend right here, Bev Vincent and Stephen King. And yeah, like you said, there's some seriously big, big dogs in this fight. So, um, so how do, how do people win? Good, good catch. All you have to do is uh, <laughs> follow us on Twitter. That's the important part. <laughs> follow us on Twitter at uh, dead underscore headspace. And uh, we will announce that the day of the uh, episode's release. A simple uh, follow us, follow Bev, probably follow Rich or Cemetery Dance, and uh, re- retweet it. That's it. I've noticed if there's more than two steps, people just uh, don't give a shit. <laughs> this is a good book, man. So I'm just, uh, you know, we want as many people to enter as I can. Um, Brennan, take it so, away, sir. I, I'd like to know how, how it came about, because what's so interesting about it is it's not just modern names. I mean, we've got Arthur Conan Doyle in there, uh, Ambrose Bierce. So where did the idea come from and how does it kind of come to fruition? So it's all because of the Dark Tower. Is it um, all things? All things, yeah. yeah all all things, things go to the tower. <laughs> yeah. So when the, the Dark Tower movie premiered, um, a, lot, a bunch of us were invited to go to Bangor for a special screening that was given by uh, the local radio station. And so Rich Chismar was there with his uh, sons and uh, Robin Firth, uh, who you may know is another Dark Tower writer uh, involved in the Marvel series and has written a concordance. People from Sony came in uh, and uh, Stephen King's office hosted uh, a dinner before the screening at this uh, 59, uh, this uh, 50s diner right across from Bangor Airport. And so Bangor is not the easiest place in the world to, to get to. There are no direct flights. You always have to take a puddle jumper at some point. And everybody who was there had some story about the the ordeal of their trip to get to Bangor. And so I was sitting uh, with Rich Chismar and his two sons, just, you know, shooting the breeze, catching up. And Steve was working the room, hearing all these stories. And at a certain point, he just looked at Rich and he marched across the room and he said, I've just had this great idea for an anthology. <laughs> he said, I've, I've been reading Arthur Conan Doyle recently and I just read The Horror of the Heights. We need to do an anthology of all the scary stories involving flying. And, and Steve himself has been not too shy over the years to talk about the fact that he hates flying. So that was you know, a theme near and dear to his heart. And they looked at Rich and he said, of course, you'll publish it. And then, and then he sort of <laughs> pauses for a moment and says, but I'll, I'll need some help finding all the other stories. And he looked at me and he said, that'll be your job. And I always joked to Rich, I said, if I had chosen that moment to go to the bathroom, it could have been somebody else entirely who got the gig, but uh, <laughs> he picked me. And, and so, I, you know, ideas like that just happen and, you know, you never know how serious somebody is and whether it's got any traction. So when I got back to Texas, I took him seriously and I started diving in and finding him stories. You know, the Richard Matheson one was, of course, the first one that came to everybody's mind. And uh, we started doing a little digging around and he sent me some ideas and I sent him some ideas. One thing we discovered is it's not a very large pool of stories. We pretty much got all that we could find. Um, There are movies, of course, many, many movies uh, set in airports and airplanes and things like that. But in, in terms of short fiction, we pretty much gathered everything we could get. And the original idea was that Steve would include the Langoliers. But as we started working through the anthology, King is in a special category. Things that for him are considered novellas are novels for anybody else. The Langoliers (laughs) is 90,000 words. It is fully as long as the rest of the anthology. And so we thought that sort of tilts the scales a little bit just a little a little bit so as we were talking about he said well you know what do you think if i write a new story and i'm thinking oh no steve please don't write a new story for our anthology that wouldn't be any good at all (laughs) so he came up with the turbulence expert and then he was talking about the story with his son joe hill and joe said you know i think i could write something for this too and joe came up with this really really powerful story called you are released 
which takes place in an airplane uh, that's in the air when a nuclear war starts beneath them. And for me, one of the most interesting aspects of his story is that there are probably seven or eight viewpoint characters. And every one of them, you get to see from inside their own head, and then you get to see them from somebody else's viewpoint, and often somebody who is very unlike them. So you have a liberal and a redneck. They interact. And you've got an older woman and a younger man, and they interact. And it's this democratic, because they're all treated well. You know, even though the redneck is somebody who maybe I'm not politically aligned with, you get, you're enough inside his head that you understand who he is and where he's coming from. And he's treated very sympathetic. And it's, it's just a marvel of storytelling uh, from that aspect. So we had those two new stories. And then everything else is uh, a reprint dating back to turn of the century, like you said, Conan Doyle. Uh, Ambrose Bierce, a very, very short piece, um, Ray Bradbury, um, and then some more contemporary writers uh, like uh, David Scow and uh, E. Michael Lewis and, and and some people that I'd never really heard of before, but we, they just came up. Uh, you know, you search. <laughs> One thing we discovered was if you Google search scary flying story, stories, what you're going to get are people who've had scary flying stories. You're not going to find short stories. And the introduction that Steve wrote for this is a scary flying story. It's uh, one of his near-death experiences that he really had when he was uh, flying in a small plane that uh, had a close encounter with a much, much larger one and created some turbulence, I guess we'll say. I, I would completely echo what you said about Joe's story. I thought it was a beautiful piece. And uh, it, when I originally read this, I think uh, 2019, uh, it was one of my favorites. And then when his uh, collection Full Throttle came out, I read it again and it, it hit just as hard the second time. It's a it's a great piece. Uh, your piece in here, uh, Zombies on a Plane, won uh, an Ig Notice Award. Am I right with that? Correct. Uh, they was nominated for it. Nominated. OK. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story. So Zombies on a Plane is one of the few stories I've written that happened because of the title. And uh, just that title popped into my head one day. It's a great title, man. It, it, yeah. And, and I just I had to write this story. And so I, it was published previously um, in a charity anthology. Um, I've written a couple of quote unquote zombie stories. And the one thing that's true about all of them is that you very rarely see any zombies in them. They're in the background. They're the motivating force. But there's not a lot of, uh, you know, people getting their arms chewed off and fighting zombies. It, it's all what happens to society because of this type of manifestation, this 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 viral outbreak. Uh, you know, when when I read the story again very recently, uh, the whole thing has got COVID written all over it. Uh, <laughs> you know, search slash replace zombies slash COVID, and you've got almost the same sort of a situation. Um, and so, the, you know, having picked that as a title, you have to say, well, how do I get the zombies on the plane? And so I come up with a, what I thought to be a sort of a creative way of doing it and then just dropping it into the reader's lap and letting them imagine what happens next. Um, there has been some interest in um, adapting that short story into a film. Nice. And the, the people who I've been talking to said, naturally, we have to show the zombies on the plane. So the, the story will just be the beginning of the story and it would go on from there. So that's something that's in the works, perhaps. Th thinking of your creative decision to get the zombies on the plane, as you put it, uh, now I'm now I'm envisioning that you know uh, COVID switch out and it's it's perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it actually the the way you executed it at you were talking about Brian Keene earlier. Uh, he wrote a story called Shelter in Place um, that was part of, uh, I believe the anthology is called New Fears, edited by Mark Morris, and it has um, a lot of the same ideas, despite the fact that it's not a zombie story. The two kind of uh, they reminded me a little bit of each other. Um, and yeah, cr creative and just an interesting 
uh, direction, let's say, without going spoiler territory. <laughs> um, just, I forgot to mention this. It applies way earlier when, Bev, you were talking how you saw Dawn of the Dead, uh, George Romero's original Dawn of the Dead. Um, and then we're talking about zombies again. Uh, audio listeners, I'm holding my coffee mug. <laughs> so I had a... You never know what the hell anything's going to turn into. So I thought I better come up with an original theme and commission that and commission the artwork for the logo. So I talked to my buddy, Todd Kiesland, um, and he, I, I just told him my ideas. And long story short, he based it off of the zombies from Dawn of the Dead. And uh, I think he did a good job, man. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just like shouting out Todd because he's an excellent author. Um, I don't know if you've read Devil's Creek, but that's, it did something to religion that I never, ever, ever could have imagined. It, it was like Lovecraft meets Southern horror meets, uh, I don't even know what else. But yeah, that's just my quick plug to Todd Keeslin because it applied. So, uh, so, friend... so, so Don, Don, Don is the one in the, the shopping mall, right? Yep. Yeah. So the thing that I remember most vividly about watching that for the first time on a VH system is... When the guy, when the zombie gets his top of his head cut off by yes. the helicopter rotor, <laughs> and we play that back and forth a bunch of times to see you know, see the top of his head just go like a frisbee take off out of uh, out of shot. It's just such a cool, uh, it, it's such a cool movie, and I think it was uh, was it Mark Steensland that was there? No, that's the, oh wait, no, that was Day of the Dead. Uh, because he was a journalist back then. Yeah, that would have been... Okay, never mind. That... Mark, Mark's an old buddy of mine. We used to be uh, roommates at uh, Nikon. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, we had him uh, We had him on season one, and he's just... He, he told us... He probably had one of the coolest answers for what got you into horror, and it was... Um, he was with his family at a drive through as a kid watching Rosemary's Baby, and he was in the trunk, and he didn't see it. He he heard oh, it. Trunk in the back seat. You don't put kids in the trunk. <laughs> they, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's a different horror story. <laughs> yeah, that's a different horror story. So he was like in a hatchback, I believe, like a station wagon, and he heard Rosemary's Baby, and oh, the wow. images that popped in his head. I, I think that might be worse. I don't know <laughs> if you're gonna be able to see this or not. Uh, it blends in. Oh man, I could. I can't. It's just like yeah. a floating head. So it's a movie poster from uh, The Weeping Woman, one of uh, Mark's uh, early movies. Very yeah. cool. I, I, I've got a signed copy of the poster. That's really neat. Um, I'd love to know about Nikon as someone that does want to go there eventually, because when I was going to go to my first con, Scares a Cure, uh, COVID hit. But I'm going, I'm going this year with my family. Stoked for that, but Nikon is. I'm a Massachusetts boy, so it's. Oh wow! Yeah. I mean, like, I gotta go to that. There, I know it's very limited, but the people that go there, it's just a bunch of authors I love. So, can you tell anyone else that may not know about Nikon your experience with it and what it means to you? So, Nikon is the Northeast, technically, I guess, horror writers convention, but a Nikon Northeast Con. It was founded by. Donald M. Grant, um, who published the Dark Tower books, um, after a world fantasy convention that Steve King and some other people were at, um, Bob Booth, and they decided the Grant and Booth decided that they wanted to create a, a writers' convention in Rhode Island, and. For the first many, many years of its existence, it was held at Roger Williams University in, in, in Rhode Island. And it's different from just about every other conference I've ever been to in a number of ways. First of all, it's got this core group of people who just keep going back year after year after year. So they always cap it at 200. I would say there's probably at least 120 of them that you're guaranteed you're going to see most of them from one year to the next. So there's that community that you build. You, you become a Nikon camper. And it's a very laid back conference uh, because it's on the university campus. Um, there are, you know, talks and sessions and readings and things like that. But most of the time we're just hanging out in the quad drinking or, or playing darts or softball or, you know, we went bowling one year or mini golf. 
And so it's got this this very just, I don't know, very relaxing uh, atmosphere. And you're it's, it's mostly writers, but not exclusively. There are fans, readers uh, who come as well. Um, and it's the first time I went um, was I had a story accepted for Borderlands 5 anthology. And that anthology also had Steve King's um, stationary bike in it. And Tom and Elizabeth Monteleone, who were the editors of the uh, of the Borderlands series at that time, said, oh, you know, you, you should come to this convention. And so it was really on the strength of that that I went. And some of the people who were going there I knew from other conventions. But in large part, I was just diving into a total unknown situation. And I think the one thing that's true about Nikon is you either immediately get it or you immediately don't. <laughs> And if you immediately get it, you're you swear right then and there you're coming back next year and every year thereafter. Um, but if you're not comfortable with mosquitoes and drinking beer outside and lumpy beds and dodgy food, you know, cafeteria food, then it's it might not be for you. You know, rooming with three or four other people in in dorm style accommodations. Um, the accommodations have changed a little bit over the years. We moved over to. Uh, uh, essentially like a red roof in uh, but you always have a roommate um, the food got a little bit better um, <laughs> the, the the quad got a little bit smaller uh, one year we were there and we didn't have the entire hotel there was a wedding party going on and I poor wedding party because we're out drinking and carousing and playing music until the small hours telling horror stories and and they've got the bridal party there so I, I, ever since then we've sort of taken over the whole whole, whole hotel just to keep from maiming and marring other people who might accidentally be uh, attending this thing. But it's just, it's just the greatest bunch. You know, we have a roast every year and the roast is brutal. It, that is absolutely brutal. And the person who's being roasted doesn't know that they're getting roasted and they yanked <laughs> up on the stage. And there is no holds barred. Just assassinate their character in every way that you possibly can. Um, in nice. the early in the early days, Peter Straub used to go. Um, King went one time. Joe Hill's been there at least once. Um, F. Paul Wilson is a regular. Uh, Doug Winter, um, but yeah, it's and, and of course Brian and uh, yeah, it's just a, a great experience. Unfortunately, we've not been able to have it for the last two years. Um, it's a, they're going to do something virtual this year. Um, hopefully, we'll be back to a live event next year. I know that. Uh, oh God, I can't. His his last name slipped in my mind. Tony. I know that he records everything. I can't. Tony Trumbull. Yep, yep. Yep. How to forget that? I know that. Um, he he's like the documentarian yep. of that convention. That's really cool. Um, I have a picture that he took of me. Um, the last time we were there, there was this uh, local. Um, van that comes by that sold frozen ices that are they're locally familiar some sort of a lemon ice and he's got this picture of me drinking out of it sucking on the straw with my I have your hat on and and I said there's something familiar about that photograph and I looked at King's cameo from the second movie it and there's this photograph of him he, you know he plays the guy working in the uh, uh, the used store where Bill gets his bicycle back. And yeah. I put those two pictures side by side, and I swear this was not orchestrated. They're exactly the same pose. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, Brendan, you got any questions about Nikon? Because I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. You know, I really, I really don't. I didn't know much about it, except that it happened in, you know, my neck of the woods. I'm a... Uh, I'm in Massachusetts. Probably if I got in the car right now, I could be in Providence in 15 minutes. Um, but no, other than that, I wasn't super knowledgeable about it. There's a lot of writers in Mass that I I had no idea. Like Paul Tremblay, he's, yep. let's see, what was that, like 20 minutes from Bridgewater, Brennan? Uh, Bridgewater is my hometown. I, I live in South Jersey now, but Bridgewater is my hometown. And um, one of my best friends is in uh, Paul's hometown and and that park that he wrote devil's rock um i've been there many times and i was like this is he's kind of well known it's pretty cool yeah. man yeah. uh you know what 
I know you've talked about the subject a lot, so we don't have to go into depth about it. And if you don't want to talk about it, you can say, obviously, pass. But I kind of want to hear anything that maybe you haven't talked about in a while or often about your how you became the first go-to guy, the source of the Dark Tower. Because that's, that's a lot of shit to carry on your shoulders, man. <laughs> The the way it all really it's it's a long and convoluted story, but I'll try to sort of hit the high spots. So back in the 1990s, I got into the internet fairly early, and there was this bulletin board system that developed into a thing called Usenet. And the closest analog to it these days, I would say, is Reddit. Um, every author or movie or musician had there was a a Usenet news group, and of course there was a Stephen King news group, and it was really, really active. Uh, hundreds of posts a day, people interacting from all across the world. And I'm the kind of guy that when somebody asks a question, if I don't know the answer, I'll go look it up. And I had Stephen Spignacy's book, The Shape Under the Sheet, the Stephen King Encyclopedia, which basically lists every character, every location, um, from all of Steve's early books. And so I would have that book sitting next to me and somebody would say, oh, what was that guy's name in that book? And I'd, you know, page, oh yeah, you know, some tertiary character. And I'd say, oh no. And so I always tell Spignacy that he made me look a lot smarter than I really was because I was just looking this shit up. But because the internet was so new, publishers were sort of keeping an eye on things to see, you know, what are the possibilities here? What should we be doing? And because of my, what I call my know-it-all reputation, people started behind the scenes telling me things. You know, this book's going to be coming out, or it's, you know, something's going to happen, this TV series, or, you know, just things that uh, I was able to then sort of tell the world about. Um, and so that, again, that sort of gave me this reputation. And so when Rich Chismar... Um, relaunched Cemetery Dance Magazine in about 99-2000. He said, you know, how would you like to write the King News column for the magazine? And I, the magazine has always got a column. Every issue's got a King News and Reviews thing. And I thought, hey, this guy's going to pay me to do something that I've been doing for free for the last eight or nine years. So, hey, where do I sign up? Um, and so that sort of got me into a bigger audience. Um, and but people kept asking me, you know, you're doing all this stuff. When are you going to write a book about King, about his his writings? And I, I've all, I'd always sort of said it's such a big subject. I mean, even in you know early 2000s, there were so many books. Um, you know, a friend of mine uh, had had written a book about Peter Straub's uh, called "At the Foot of the Story Tree," and it uh, I'm going to blank on his name, Bill. Yeah, I'm going blank on it. Um, and, but he was able to cover Straub's entire output up to that point. And I thought, to do the same thing for King, even at that point, you're talking like a, a not not even a PhD thesis. It would be like a, a life's work. And I thought, yeah, I, I just can't see doing it. But when I found out that he was going to write the last three books in the Dark Tower series back to back, I thought, Here's a series of books, just seven volumes, but he started writing the first one when he was, before he started writing Carrie even, and he's written different installments throughout his writing career to this point, and the series has all of these connections to the rest of the Stephen King universe. Now, here's something that is manageable a person could write about the Dark Tower series and hopefully say something meaningful, not only about the series, but about King's larger uh, creative universe. And so this was, you know, the, the books were, you know, years away from being published even. Um, so I pitched the idea uh, to a publisher. Um, I got King's permission. I think even before I did that, I said, you know, if you hate this idea, just say so and, you know, move on to other things. But having the cemetery dance columns as 
um, examples to show to uh, an editor uh, in New York to say, you know, this is this is how I write. Um, they were a really good foot in the door. So everything that I had done up to that point really established the foundation for me writing this book. And then the the, the daring, audacious thing that I did was I uh, sent a fax to King's office. This was back in the days. We, we, we had email, but I sent a fax saying, you know, I'd, what would be really cool is if I could have this book done shortly after the final book in the series comes out. So it'll be like right there for people. And I said, you know, so in my wildest dreams, the FedEx truck would pull up in front of my house and deliver the manuscripts to the last three books so I could start working on it and have it ready um, at, the, at the time that the Dark Tower 7 comes out. And that happened. Um, I got this shipment of 2,500 pages of manuscripts, 2,000, uh, no, 20 pounds, showed up on my doorstep a few days later. And I got to read the last three books in the Dark Tower series two years before anybody else did. And, you know, take all my copious notes and and then the road to the Dark Tower came from that. And then you went on the internet to gloat. Well, when you got a book coming out, you have to do a little bit of promotion. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 was, I was very cagey. I mean, of course, in the very earliest days, I was worried that somebody would come and rob me. <laughs> so you don't want to admit you got this valuable stuff. And his publisher was really nervous that he'd done this because she didn't, they didn't want anything about the series to get spoiled in advance. And so I was very hardline. I didn't talk about anything at all i think the the one thing that i would uh tell people was how many pages there were in the books that was the one bone that i threw to people um but yeah no details even my editor um ron martirano from uh new american library at the time even he hadn't read the last three books until very late in the process when I mean, he was reading my synopses and what i was writing about it. and so we finally got permission for me to uh, photocopy all 2,500 pages and send them off to him so that he could have that. And of course, these were first draft. So, you know, at, at a certain point, I would get like the next draft. Uh, and then I didn't have the final draft of the seventh book. So there are some things in The Road to the Dark Tower that are based on first draft manuscript that got changed. And so people have come back to me and said, well, hey, that's not right. You know, you got that wrong. And I said, well, you know, he changed it too late in the process for me to to be able to do anything about it. The Cemetery Dance edition, which came later, uh, I was able to update with the, the seventh published book. But Were people, I'm curious, because uh, he wrote the first one, and that came out in, what, the eight, 80s? 82, uh, yep. So you had your pulse on the early internet days when people were talking about him. Was there... I guess a good modern example of what I'm about to ask, George uh, George R. R. Martin. Yep. It seems like that guy can say anything unless it's book uh, six. They're going to rip him apart. Were people that kind of demanding with Kings 5, 6, and 7 in the Dark Towers even back then? They were demanding uh, all the way along. Oh, my uh, God. The, 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 there are some great stories from his office staff um you know they said you know we we answer most of his uh fan mail but whenever a, a letter comes in demanding the next dark tower book we always put it square on his desk <laughs> and and there was one that somebody sent them him a polaroid of a teddy bear wrapped up in chains and they say write the next book or the teddy bear dies it was you know when faqs became a thing on the internet the number one faq on king's site was when is the next dark tower book coming out especially after the third book when it ends on a cliffhanger and we had to wait six years for the resolution of that cliffhanger i mean i i started reading the dark tower series in 84 and so i've been with it you know by the time the last book came out in 2004 i've been with it for 20 years and you know i i wasn't quite as mm, insistent about i mean because king was writing all sorts of other things that i was really enjoying um so you know i took each one in its time but i always you know got got the book and read it immediately and was always because 
I had read The Gunslinger so many times. It's a short book. I loved its mood. It's so different from the rest of his stuff. And for quite a while, it was the only thing we had of Dark Tower. So, you know, when I'd go back and reread King's stuff, I reread The Gunslinger, and I probably had read it five times by the time the second book came out. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the Dark Tower journey has been part of my journey for most of my adult life. In a, a comment, just a fun comment for number three to, uh, and four, the, the six-year gap, Blaine's a pain. Okay, back. Blaine's a pain, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, and then when King was almost killed in a car wreck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the simple my god if he dies he's never going to finish the dark tower series <laughs> I, Gee, thanks guys that's you know, got other things to worry about besides that but thanks <laughs> you know like all three of us are writers and i know brennan and i share a dream of one day hopefully before we're like way way older uh, we're both in our 30s that we can eventually write full time and, and that'd be great like where i could just take my family on vacation I don't want to do, uh, not that it would ever happen, but I wouldn't want to be in King's shoes in the sense of the fanfare, man. That's going to be annoying every single day. No matter what he says, it's under a t like a, a microscope. And, oh, how's he oh, deal yeah. with that shit? I mean, even his tweets get articles written about them. Yeah, he gets and, torn and, apart and, for stupid shit. Yeah, and, and to get a little bit of a visibility into what that must be like, on a number of occasions he has retweeted something that i've tweeted and so i get benefit all the responses all the notifications to that oh and i oh just God. you know i can always tell when he's done it because all of a sudden you can just see the notification notification count i mean i've had tweets hit like eight hundred thousand impressions oh because he has retweeted them and, mm. it's, uh, and it's gotta be like that for him every day uh, yeah, I mean, my wife and I have talked about that a little bit. It, it would be nice to be a successful full-time writer, but there are potential downsides to it. And I mean, I, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, and, and yeah, I, I've just started revisiting Lisey's story because the the Apple TV uh, series is coming out in June, mm -hmm. and a lot of that book is about what it's like to be the wife of the famous writer mm. and you know how the wife gets marginalized because all the attention is on the writer and you know she's off of, you know they all these group photos and you know he's front and center and you can see her left elbow in the picture because you know she's not the important part of it but just the adulation um the fact that the majority of the fans love this writer but there are a few that don't and those few that don't are really problematic. Um, and that's been an experience in King's world, too. You know, there's, there's this guy who's convinced that he he was actually the person who killed John Lennon. Um, and he shows up in Bangor every now and then with this van with all of his tracts painted on the side of it, trying to spread the gospel of it wasn't Chapman, it was King who actually did it. And, yeah, and he, they've had people break into the house and... That's yeah. crazy. You so know, that's why I, when I had the Dark Tower manuscripts, I was thinking, yeah, nobody's going to know about that because I don't want any of the crazies here. <laughs> oh, hell no. Yeah, without, without Tabitha saving Carrie's story, uh, the manuscript to Carrie. Yep. Hey, come on. I mean, he doesn't get where he is today without his wife. And I've read from him, um, I forget when, it was a few years ago, that one thing that he attributes to all su success is that his wife, his family, they've always been there for him. And I think that's important, too. Like him, Keen, Chismar, Joel Lansdale, they all say the same thing. You know, like family, that's like the most important yeah. thing. Yeah, my wife doesn't read a lot of what I write, but she's my number one fan. Same here. Uh, yeah. She has <laughs> always made a lot of room for me to write. Um, I'm getting, you guys are in your thirties. So I, I'm, I'm staring 60 in the mirror in a, in a five weeks, um, thinking about the possibility of, uh, you know, retirement, having full time writing ability, maybe because one of my goals has always been to write novels mm. and, and I've written a number, but I've never really had the, the traction to, to do much with them. 
um, my story in Dissonant Harmonies is the longest piece of fiction that I've ever published um, at 40,000 words, but I've got novels. Um, they're not in the trunk. They're uh, on the desk, I guess I would say. There, there are <laughs> things that I think have real possibilities, but I just need to have the time to get them out there because, you know, I, I talk about the two hours of writing every morning. Um, the reality is that it's two hours of writing business. And some days the writing business is um, doing submissions, um, doing yeah. research, um, doing interviews. Um, and so having a little bit more time every day when you can sort of have time to do the business um, and it's not this, it, it doesn't take away the writing time. It's just, you've got extra time or you, or you could just go off and read or watch a movie or something like that. But, uh, two hours or three hours or four hours, whatever it expands into is always completely protected then. And you don't have to do the, you know, where I, I just got a rejection for the short story. Where am I going to send it out next? You know, go do the research, uh, <laughs> get the manuscript ready, uh, write the cover letter for this particular market, make sure the it's in doc format and not doc X because that's all they'll take. And you know, it's, th there's a lot of extra stuff to the writing business beyond just putting the words on the page. Yeah, and you know, I'm in. Honestly, I'd be real interested to read whenever that novel comes out because I'm curious to see what you do with that, Brendan. I've talked in a lot uh, enough. <laughs> well, why don't you jump in, buddy? You know, Bev, I have a really unfair question, and if you want to skirt it, I will understand. But when you first read the ending for the last Dark Tower book, what was your reaction? My re reaction? Okay, so I'm sitting on my couch with this stack of manuscript pages, taking a page off one side and reading it and putting it down on the next one. I've got maybe 250 pages left and I'm looking at the clock and I'm supposed to be hitting the shower to get ready to go off to the day job. And I just can't stop. And I get to that point where he says, you know, you might not want to read any further. And I just said, oh, okay, I got to keep going. And the clock keeps ticking. I got to the end and I thought it couldn't have ended any other way. I was just to me it just could not have ended any other way and so the, the I, I at that time i wasn't emailing king very much um i had a few questions uh, while i was working the book but the one thing i i did say to him that time was you made me late for work <laughs> and he, he liked that i mean and that was that to him that was a compliment the the, the book had made me about an hour late for work yeah what i Go ahead, Sorry, Brandon. soon jump in real quick. Um, I, it is so gratifying to hear, you know, the person who objectively knows this series, you know, as uh, better than anyone else but the person who wrote it uh, say that. Because I, I have always been very surprised at the negative reactions to that ending because I, I, I'm 100% on board with you. I don't think it could have ended any other way. I thought that, you know, don't read past here because it's just going to piss you off. I thought that whole epilogue to an epilogue to an epilogue was perfect um yeah. and you know I, I i've revisited the whole series you know three times which usually impresses people unless they're you which you've probably read it 117 <laughs> times so. six, six times for when i was working on the the dark tower companion each time with a different colored highlighter to uh to, to because one of the things i did was i i built the timeline you know, how many days because that was one question people already had, always had was from the beginning of the first page of the Dark Tower of the Gunslinger to the end, you know, how long passes? And of course, time is a little bit wibbly wobbly, but I was able to map out uh, a fairly good timeline that shows that it starts in the summer, it goes into the fall, goes into the winter, goes into the next spring. So it's basically a year with a few holy weird, shit, really with a few weird slides in time. Uh, you know, when he's having the palaver with the man in black or, or the, the sort of the eternal night that takes place when he's telling the story of Wizard and Glass. But really, it's it's a pretty much a, a calendar year. I think I mapped it out to 336 days. But I went through with a highlighter and I said the next day or two days later or and I, I got it all. It's all in the back of the road to the Dark Tower. You can see what happens on every day. And I get to know what, what she's <laughs> 
<laughs> and I got I got a know from you, man. What do you think when King wrote himself into the series? Uh, I I got a, even before I uh, got to read the manuscripts. I'm pretty sure that's the timing on this. So 2003. Yeah, I think even before I got to read the manuscripts, I went. Um, th- there was this fundraiser for Frank Muller, who was the audiobook narrator, who did a lot of King's early works. And he was in a motorcycle accident and severely injured. And so a group of writers, uh, Straub, John Grisham, uh, Pat Conroy, and King got together in, in New York and did a fundraiser. And I went up to that, and I had uh, an idea that I pitched to them about a way to make some more money, which worked out pretty well. And so this uh, FedEx envelope showed up at my door one day, and I opened it up. And it was a, just a little yellow writing tablet, not even one of the big ones, just like one of the little, I don't know if it's like five by three or whatever. And it was just filled with handwritten pages, which was that scene, mm. which Steve wrote while he was on the airplane going to visit Frank Muller. And so he sent that handwritten manuscript to me as a thank you for working on the, the fundraiser. Wow. And I had, at that point, I hadn't read uh, even Wolves of the Kala, um, but I had that scene where Steve appears in the book, and I, I, I didn't have any issues with it. Um, I thought it was an interesting concept because it, I mean, he doesn't like the term metafiction, but really it's the sort of the metafictional aspect of the series where the creator is an influence in the creation yeah um and and you know it all boils down to you know if if steve had been hit by that car and died what would have happened to roland and i'm sure that had to be going through his mind and i'm sure people were making him think of it after the accident and so that it all seemed very organic to me that's awesome that's pretty awesome answer man um you know if you want another controversial opinion I like the damn Dark Tower movie. <laughs> I don't know if we can go on after that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm just going to throw it out there. Number two is my favorite. Um, drawn of the three. I, I don't know. That's all I got to say about that because it's just, it's so different. It is so different. Yeah. And it's, it, it's just so perfect. And there's so many scenes that I can pick up that I'm like, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. <laughs> um, I wow, that that comment threw me off. I had one more question. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Damn it, Pat. Just right. help. It's good. <laughs> See, I, I had an advantage in that I had interviewed Ron Howard and Akiva Goldsman when I was working on the Dark Tower Companion. And I was really surprised. They laid out their entire vision for me of what they had in mind. And they were going to do this series of movies with interstitial TV series that the epic stuff would be in the movies and the sort of small person, the character driven things like Wizard and Glass, perhaps, were going to be like limited miniseries in between. Oh, wow. And they, they told me the whole big picture. And, and this was while they were still potentially working on it. Um, and so I had a couple of years at least to sit with their idea of how they were going to reimagine the series. And so the, uh, although, you know, I would have liked the movie to have been a little bit more, a little bit bigger perhaps. Um, and you know, we sort of watched in dismay as, you know, various um, movie companies dropped out or they slashed the budget and they, you know, tried to reduce it. But, I enjoyed the hell out of the movie. I really did. Oh, that's awesome, man. It really is. Like you like people like what they like. You know? Yeah. Um, I like a lot of unpopular things, but I, I don't know. Whatever. Teach your own. Ron Howard. He, he see is he as nice in person as he seems on screen, man. I tell you, uh, <laughs> I was sitting at my desk at work when I got a call from my wife, and she said Ron Howard's going to call you <laughs> because we had set up the interview for a couple of days later yeah and he had some time he was in london filming rush uh, the race car movie Mm -hmm. and they were driving back from filming at the end of the day 
and it was a long drive. So he's in the back of the limo and he had this window. And so I was really fortunate in that I had my recording gadget for the telephone with me, which I didn't always have. And I had my notes or I could get my hands on my notes for what I wanted to talk to him about. And so I had like almost no warning. Here he is on the phone and we spent 45 minutes, an hour maybe on the phone. Yeah, he's absolutely as, as nice as he seems to be. And Akiva Goldsman, too. I mean, we had a great conversation, uh, even getting around to talking about Fringe, which was uh, still on the air at the time, and how much I had enjoyed that series. That's pretty cool, man. Did, um, I'm trying to think, did he, did Ron Howard do anything with uh, this TV miniseries called, it's based off of Walter Isaacson's, uh, one of his biographies on Einstein. I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm looking it up right now. I'm pretty sure he directed that. Uh, any ring any yeah, bells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah I saw that, uh, that Einstein series. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure he directed that. I, yeah, I, I think so. I love that. And Geoffrey, Geoffrey Rush, is he's a fantastic author. But um, I don't know. I just like talking about Walter Isaacson and that, uh, that applied. <laughs> He's my favorite biographer, man. He's fantastic. Okay, I remember my question. Um, I posed this to Richard Chismar when he was on. Um, and I'll ask you the same thing. Stephen King, I don't think it's really an opinion at this point. He's, without a doubt, the most successful author ever in history. And I don't know if it's ever going to be repeated. I don't see how it could be. You're in a very, very rare minority uh of people in his circle now i'm not saying like you're you know i don't know what that means exactly with you and richard and whoever else but what's that feel like because it's going to be a little unreal i would think even at this point it's it's a lot unreal Uh, and and rich and i have been friends for over 20 years and we sometimes pinch each other (laughs) uh just to say you know can you believe that this has happened to us? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we both grew up in the, at least in the 80s, um, reading King and, you know, just absolutely admiring his work and never, ever imagining that we would get to the point where you could just sort of shoot him an email and say, hey, did you catch that new TV show last night? Or what do you think about this? Or uh, what are you reading? Or um, And then, you know, for, for Rich to publish him um you know starting with a short story in cemetery dance but then later doing you know limited editions and then to to collaborate with him on the gwendy books and and you know for me to uh you know to get his approval to do some of the critical stuff i've done and then to do flight or fright yeah it's um you you could never plan (laughs) <laughs> no. that trajectory yeah um and it's it's uh sometimes it's a little bit hard to i mean i i can sort of go back and trace the various stepping stones along the way the, the interesting chaotic uh random things that happened that put this all together but uh yeah it's very surreal i don't even know what to say man because he got me back into as an adult, he got me back into horror. Well, my wife got me back into reading, and he got me back into horror. And I, he's he's influenced so much. I mean, that's really all I could say. I don't know what else to say. I don't know where I'm going with this, but that's well, so cool. and, and and it's not just horror. I mean, oh well, yeah, definitely. I've not. written I've written essays, uh, one fairly recently, about him as a crime writer. Yep, because he's got a really solid uh, chunk of either straight crime or crime that crosses the the, the breach into the, the the fantastic as well um i've just finished reading billy summers which is his uh, next book which is straight crime there's not a well, yeah, i'm, I'm going to say there's not a there's not a hint of supernatural there, there are some allusions to the stephen king universe uh, as he's want to do but but it's really it's a it's a hitman story uh and uh you know, in his previous book later, is the other side of the spectrum. It's a supernatural crime story. Um, and so, I mean, he's got the Mercedes books and The Outsider. And when he and I are uh, swapping recommendations, um, 
most frequently it's for crime series. Hmm. Uh, when we find something, it's so like the, the the new one on HBO, uh, the the mayor of East Town. Um, that, that's uh, uh, Kate Winslet. Um, that's something that's right in our wheelhouse, you know. And, and I don't know if if he started it yet or not, but I've certainly recommended it to him. Um, and and we love the Scandinavian crime series. Um, and we what was the oh there's a new one just out. Um, it's on BritBox. It's called Grace. Uh, John Sim, uh, who was in uh, Life on Mars, and uh, he, he played the master on Doctor Who. Um, he, he's one of our favorites, and he's he's back in this uh, series based on a British crime series um, that I had nice. heard about. So I told him about it, and I'd forgotten about it. And when the first episode came out, he told me about it. And so it's a lot of crime. We, 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 we're involved in a lot of crime. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, Brennan and my wife, uh, they're, they they say they don't like horror, but they like uh, they like true crime stuff. And uh, a show a show that we really loved, I love season one more than two, was Mindhunter on Netflix. Oh, yeah. That first season, though, man, it's so freaking killer. And, uh, oh, God, what's the, the main killer's name? It's slipping my mind right now. TK. Yeah. What's that? BTK. No, not, no, no, no. The main killer. Uh, Ed, um, the Ed campus. A game. Yeah, no, uh, Ed Kemper. Ed, oh, Ed, Ed Kemper, Kemper, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you go back and you see videos of the real Ed Kemper, the actor who played him is just dead nuts on he is so creepy and, and the fact that the real ed kemper did like hundreds of narrations on books that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> audiobooks yeah i just thought it was in a yeah, very kill it killing is just a pastime you know you got to do something else to fill the hours <laughs> just in a very dark sense of humor kind of way it's it's kind of funny that he talks so much he's like the opposite of most killers he yeah. talks so much about his killings that it's too much. <laughs> it is it's way too much, yeah. But, but I, I find my my fiction writing over the past uh, dozen years or so has really migrated away from horror into crime as well. Hmm. I've published a lot of um, uh, private detective stories, hard-boiled detective stories. Um, I have a novella that I self-published this year because, you know, it's COVID and you got nothing else to do. Let's figure out how to self-publish a story, which is, um, it's a cross between an Agatha Christie whodunit and a hard-boiled detective. Hmm. Um, so I put that up on Amazon just for the hell of it, just to see what this is all about. It's called The Ogilvy Affair. Um, it's a story that I wrote the first draft of it 20 years ago, and it's, uh, it was really, it was a supernatural story when it started, and as I kept rewriting it over the years, it got longer and longer and less supernatural. Um, so now it's a it's a straight crime really, story. Very cool. And two, you know what? Two crime writers that, well, actually three, I'll throw three out there. I'm sure you've heard of S.A. Cosby, Blacktop Wasteland, Razor, mm -hmm. Razor Blade Tears is uh, coming out later. He He's just, he's one of, I think it's safe to say, my name, Brennan's. Crime writers, uh, for modern writers. Sina Palayo, she's also incredible. Uh, Puerto Rican author that is uh, Chicago based, writes a lot of her stuff in Chicago. And came I was out with... just on a, a reading with her a few oh, weeks okay. ago on uh, what, what's that new uh, audio uh, app? Um, oh, so Odyssey? It, 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 it's a new. Um, uh, not band camp, something like that. Uh, so Brian Keane has an open uh, reading every mo Monday night, and he invited oh, Clubhouse. Clubhouse, Clubhouse, yeah. So Cena and uh, a another woman who I know from uh, Nikon and I all did readings together that night, and she read from her book, which is uh, poems about she's uh, every state. There's uh, at least one murder victim that she's written about from every state. Lin Linda Addison was the the third person who read that night. Uh, yeah, I just finished that man. That that collection is it's, uh, it it just knocked my socks off. Um, I at one point there's this one about uh, a poem in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and, and I reached out to her. I was like, so my grandfather's from there, and on top of that, I used to work in that city, and uh, I don't know, man. It, my experience is that. There was a group of like twelve-year-old Irish kids come walking past me. I didn't think they were gonna say anything, 
And like in my head, you know, when you see something or hear something, and then after you're replaying it, you're like, that couldn't have happened. That was a little too weird. Um, <laughs> it's just a group of kids, and I'm pretty sure they randomly told me to go fuck myself. And and they said it with such confidence <laughs> that it was as if they were adults, and they're like, don't care if you're one of us Irish fellas, uh, go fuck yourself. <laughs> so that's my experience with it. It's nothing crazy, but uh, Let's move on to upcoming projects that you want to talk about, even though you just had, uh, you know, the recent book that we talked about earlier. Yeah, Is so it- Distant Harmonies um, came out maybe a month or so ago from Cemetery Dance. Um, there's a hardcover edition that they sold originally, and uh, it's only to their uh, Cemetery Dance Collectors Club. And so that one is still at the printer, but the paperback just sort of dropped uh, yeah, like I said, a month ago. So that, that one's out in the world. Um, I've got a... This has actually been a pretty good year for me for short story acceptances. Nice. Um, I've got a whole rash of them coming out in the next uh, 6 to 12 months. Um, almost all of them, I would say, are crime stories, but there might be a... Yeah, there's a couple of horror stories to t- tossed in there for good measure, too. Uh, and then this one science fiction story for the this gaming company. I think that's going to come out next month. That's really cool, man. And that that one was that was fun because it was a little bit like writing in a foreign language, because I've I've written in uh, licensed worlds before. Um, I've done a Doctor Who story. Mm-hmm. I've done an X Files story. But those were both cases where I was already really familiar with the the worlds. And this. Uh, um renegade uh legions uh anthology man we had to learn a whole new lingo a whole new government dynamic aliens the whole whole nine yards and so it was semi uh interactive process because you know we got onto this um chat site um that gamers use and you just throw a question and said, you know, this is the scenario I'm thinking of, you know, what sort of a tank would these guys be driving? What, 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 how, what's their, uh, faster than light, uh, ships doing? Uh, so you'd, you'd sort of interact, your research wasn't with a, uh, a book or something like that it was with the people who had built the Bibles for these things. And they'd tell you, well, okay, given this scenario, we think that this would work and how it would work. And oh, don't forget to mention this. And it was, it was quite a process. That's yeah. You have very tight parameters. Uh, good for you, man. That that sounds very difficult. <laughs> it, it was. I mean, some some of the people who pitched the, the stories, when it got down to writing, they just said, "I just can't figure this out. I don't even know where to start." <laughs> and and I I had that feeling for a while too, until I got to the point where I said, "I'm just going to write this thing without worrying too much about the rules, and then we'll fix it in post," like they say. You know. <laughs> That's- no, that's probably a good approach. Oh, the third crime writer I meant to mention is Gabino Glacius. Oh, Gabino, uh, he, he published one of my short stories. Um, we did this whole Dark Holidays uh, anthology oh, that yes. happens like, in, in the course of about three weeks. Yeah. Uh, and I, I sent him a story for that, and so I have a story in there. But I know Gabino from um, KillerCon. Okay. Which uh, oh, was White uh, used to hold in uh, Las Vegas, and then he moved to Austin. So it's been in Austin, just in in Texas terms, it's just up the road a spell from me. It's only a three hour drive. <laughs> uh, so I've gone to KillerCon the last couple of times, mostly to uh, urge Brian Keane to finish his uh, uh, his story for Dissonant Harmonies. <laughs> Who is more productive, Stephen King or Gabino Glacius? <laughs> Yeah. You, don't have to, you don't have to really answer that because, yeah. like, Gabino, I don't know how he sleeps, when he sleeps. He has really just sort of blossomed into my awareness in the last year or so. But now that you're aware of him, he's everywhere. Mm. In such a beautiful way, unless you're one of those assholes that he talks about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what, I man? I'd love to know. What are you currently reading? What am I currently reading? Um, I am reading, um, uh, uh, the latest mystery writers of America anthology called when a stranger comes to town. And it was edited by a good friend of mine by the name of Michael Carita, who is an incredible thriller crime writer mm. who has had a fascinating life 
outside of writing. Um, he's been a private detective, a real private detective. Wow. Um, and when I first became aware of him, I think he was only in his like mid to late thirties and he had already published like this whole raft of books. I haven't even been able to read all of this stuff yet. His early stuff I have to go back to, but, uh, he and I've become pals. He usually, uh, when there was a book tour, he'd come to Houston to, uh, do a signing at murder by the book. And uh, we sort of got in the routine of we'd meet up for drinks beforehand and go out to dinner afterwards. And so I really miss him this year because he just has a, a new book out recently and he should have been in town and we didn't get to go out and do our, didn't have our little mail bonding thing for, for the year. But yeah, so it, it, it's a fairly loosely themed anthology, uh, strangers coming to town, people get to take them however they want to. Uh, there's a Joe Hill story in it. Um, Alifair Burke. Um, yeah, it's got quite a good selection. Um, and, and then there's another MWA anthology that just came out that I have a minuscule uh, contribution to. It's called uh, How to Write a Mystery. It's a handbook from the MWA. Mm. And they have big name writers who wrote long pieces. And then they opened it up to submissions from the riffraff and the MWA, including me. And we, we sent in these long essays and they took little snippets out of them and used that to sort of decorate the book. So I've got my oh, contribution cool. there too. Very cool. Brennan, what uh, are you reading? Oh, I'm sorry, Bev. But yeah, uh, Billy Summers is probably the, the last novel. I, I just finished reading that last week. I'm jealous. <laughs> 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 Brennan got a arc of later and he, uh, he told me about it. I'm like, oh my god, how many more books can I add to my TBR pile? <laughs> I tell you, the, the the thing that really got me with later was, I didn't realize that there was a fairly hefty excerpt from, um, what's the the other hard case crime book at, at the back of jo- this book? Joyland. Joyland. So there's a, like a sixteen or twenty page excerpt at the back, and so I'm reading along and thinking, man, I've got like 30, 40 pages left. And then all of a sudden you turn the page and, oh, I'm at the end. (laughs) It was a real surprise ending because I didn't expect it to happen that fast. (laughs) (laughs) Got to be more. (laughs) Um, I am currently reading, I think this comes out uh, sometime. Well, actually, let's see. It's May 6th right now. I believe this comes out in about a week from now. um, Called The Crucifixion Experiments from Uh, Gord Rowe. Oh, Gord. That's cool. Reissue. I believe it originally came out from Dark Regions Press. Silver Shamrocks putting it out, and you know I'm I'm gonna so, show that cover for uh, video watchers again, uh, because the, you know it's funny. We were talking about earlier how uh, my my wife does not want to read anything. I was actually talking to somebody on the phone last night about a story I'd written, and I talked about gouging eyes out, and she yells from the other room. Like what are you? What are you like? What are you talking about? But this one, it doesn't have any supernatural elements to it. Uh, you know, I see her side eyeing the cover, and I said, "This is absolutely a podcast you would listen to and a book you would read, as long as it w- it actually happened to somebody, which is objectively more horrifying than yeah. you know reading the fiction." <laughs> But it's 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 really good. It's I actually just finished it before we uh, got on. It's got that kind of hard boiled detective with, you know, riddled with flaws, trying to solve this case coming off of a suspension because you know he threw down his badge and his gun and the captain uh, you know suspended him. So you know it it's kind of it 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 um, kind of follows those tropes, but. Uh, it's got a really great voice. He does it in in first person, and it's one of those you just keep turning the the pages. The chapters are short, and you can't put it down between. You need to figure out what happens next. Well, I haven't seen Gordon in a long time. I used to run into him at uh, world horror conventions back when I first started going to those. Mm, very cool. Yeah. Well, he's got this one. He's got another one being reissued by Silver Shamrock in uh, later in the fall. And then he's got a series of new, uh, shorter works coming out with them over the next couple of years as well. So, making that comeback. Okay, so my turn. Uh, I'm reading, uh, still reading *Malignant Summer*. It is a big book by Tim Meyer. Uh, it's just a coming of age story uh, based in the '90s and uh, based in Jersey. I haven't read a whole lot of stuff based in 
uh, the state, but um, it, it's just fun. It, it's it's a fun coming of age story with uh, when he hits the supernatural and horror aspects, it he goes hardcore with it. <laughs> And the other one is by Haley Piper. She's, you know, man, um, I don't know if you've read her yet, but she does Cosmic Car in such a great way. And uh, it's her first collection called Unfortunate Elements of My Anatomy. Um, <laughs> it's It's got a lot of, I, I just, I, I feel like I'm not doing very good with my uh, descriptions, but there's a lot of powerful stories in there. And uh, they're just fun. They're it's a collection, so I don't. I can't really describe the stories because they're not long enough where I'd be able to like not spoil it. But it, it it's a good it's a good collection. I'm lo- I'm loving it so far, and uh, that's about it for me. Um, let's go to where can people follow you? you know, as long as they're not following me around the neighborhood. <laughs> There, yeah. So bevinson.com. Um, I also have a message board there. Um, so I'm on Twitter at Bev Vincent. Uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. And I've joined Clubhouse, but I really haven't figured it out all that much yet. Same here. Um, those are the main ones. Uh, Twitter is really, if you really want to know me, follow me on Twitter because I don't hold anything back there, including all of my political views. I I tend not to be political too much on Facebook, not really all that active on Facebook, but you know, the, whenever you've got something coming out, you've got to promote it a little bit, but I'm really active on Twitter and I'm really outspoken on Twitter. And in fact, the little snippet that I have in the mystery writers handbook is, you know, people tell you that you maybe shouldn't, wear your political feelings on your sleeve it'll offend some people my twitter following just blew up (laughs) has just taken off in the last year and a half since i've become a twitter political activist really i think i know why (laughs) uh, yeah and yeah so uh, yeah so it's it's actually been uh quite a positive uh and it's not all politics um you know, I, I, I read news voraciously and quite widely and a lot of topics, scientific news, um, foreign news. Um, since I come from Canada, I, I tend to be more interested, I think, in the international aspects than people who follow me as a rule. So I, I um, tweet a lot of that stuff out just to highlight things that are going on in, in my home and native land and beyond. Um, yeah, Twitter is Twitter's a big one. Instagram um yeah a little bit but not too much you know i'm i'm not inviting anyone that is uh opposed to our very outspoken views throughout the show um but i'm surprised we haven't actually had any hate mail from basically people that fall republican party man uh me yeah, and Brendan... I, I i've been lucky too i mean I, i'm not alone in being a vocal um, like Michael Marshall Smith, who's a sort of an online, I've met him a couple of times, but mostly I know him online. He's in the same camp, but he seems to attract people who want to get in his face, <laughs> you know, online. Uh, but I've been fairly fortunate in that I haven't really had that sort of blowback, had to deal with a bunch of haters. Uh, occasionally you get a bot or two, but... Uh, I've been pretty lucky. That's good, man. Um, you know, Keen seems to get a lot of hate, and then you got Pro- Paul Tremblay who uh, gets nothing but love. Nothing but love. Keen, <laughs> Keen has always been able to uh, stir shit up. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've known Brian for decades, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always fun to see him taking on the latest uh, wannabe challenger. I'm a little scared that I'm I'm like Brian in those ways, and I don't want to be, and I'm not trying to be. But you can ask Brendan; it just seems to happen. Um, I think is the term we throw around. <laughs> shit magnet. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is I work at a wastewater treatment plant, so it just makes sense. <laughs> in Atlantic City. <laughs> um. You know, if you like what you see of uh, the zombie version of me. 
for the logo, then you can go to deadheadspace.com. There's a store tab. You can click it, and you can potentially buy uh, my ugly mug on a coffee mug or a mask or a few other things. Um, so, look, that's another thing. We don't have to worry about a certain type of people buying the products because one of them's a mask. <laughs> 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 now, I want to hear any final thoughts, noises, anything that we haven't talked about that you want to discuss. Table's yours, sir. Okay. Um, I'm about to turn 60. I'm now a grandfather twice over. Congrats. Uh, yeah, my uh, th- my daughter and her family live in Japan, and they're moving back from Japan this summer, so we're going to have everybody back after after this COVID nightmare of not being able to see them for so long, except mm-hmm. through uh, a little tiny pinhole camera on a computer. Um, I'm always working on essays, um, the occasional interview, uh, book reviews, but really, my focus, other than getting short stories into circulation and maybe writing a few more, is my whole goal is to really get some traction with novels. And I've got a few uh, for consideration. One is a, I guess you would call it horror, but it's a ghost story. Um, but the other ones are straight crime. Mm. Um, I have a bunch of short stories that I've published that feature this guy named Benjamin Cain. Um, who's Kane Detective Agency in, in Houston. And I've got some manuscripts uh, of novel-length things that uh, explore his world in greater depth. And one of my goals would really be to sort of get to the point where I could do a book like that every year or so. Um, but then I've got some other fun crime ones. I've, I've got maybe four stories that feature these six um, very inept criminals who uh, go on capers that always go hilariously wrong. (laughs) Um, In one of them, they try to steal maple syrup uh, (laughs) because they've heard how much the price of maple syrup has gone. And of course, it's called sticky business because it doesn't end well. And there's a bank job and there's uh, one involving lobsters. And yeah, so so I'm thinking that when I get enough of those, I'd like to put a collection together of the... uh, it's sort of like the the apple dumpling gang that couldn't shoot straight kind of uh, whimsical crime that uh, I've had some good success with. Consider the show whenever those come about, man, because we're we like we like talking and reading crime as well. Um, like I said, man, Sean Cosby. So I'm just anything that guy writes, I'm I'm there. Um, Brennan, any final thoughts or anything that you would like to say? Or noises, of course. Uh, uh, noises. Do you have do you have a funny? I don't have any noises for you. I was just reminding you. Don't but... bring it up then. <laughs> uh, Bev, I want to thank you for uh, you know giving us almost two hours of your time tonight. We really appreciate that, and I I think we covered we covered a lot. I think we got through almost everything, except uh, you brought up Doctor Who a few times, so you can't get out of here without letting us know your favorite Doctor. <laughs> the fifth Doctor. The fifth Doctor. Okay. Um, so the the story that I wrote is a fifth Doctor story that features him and Perry, and one of the reasons why I picked that was because those two characters are only together for a very brief time. Uh, the fifth Doctor goes through his reincarnation uh, shortly after Perry joins him, and so in terms of getting continuity in the the Doctor Who universe, that was a nice little chunk of time where you could go in and sort of fit something into their story without getting too worried about messing with the timeline. Um, I I actually got my copy of the anthology signed by uh, the fifth doctor. uh, We have a local uh, comic con called Comic Palooza and one year they had doctors four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, plus uh, John Barrowman. Uh, We're all here so I was able to get a number of them to uh, sign my Doctor Who anthology. Wow. That's excellent. And I'm going to leave with this. Uh, the first time I heard your name, I saw the Dark uh, Tower Companion. And uh, we got this chain of stores. I think it's just New Jersey, but I could be wrong, called Ollie's. And they have these brand new books, are beautiful books for like three, four, five, whatever bucks. And I go a little crazy sometimes to the point now where uh, I got a whole tote full of King books. And my <laughs> wife's like, Pat, the house is so big. 
Okay, so uh, I had to I had to pump the brakes a little bit. But long story short, I found your uh, book there, and ever since then, you've been on my radar. So it means a lot to me that you are on the show, and like Brent said, for uh, two hours of of your time. So for that, I say thank you, sir. My pleasure indeed. <laughs> pleasure indeed. And um, next episode is with Haley Piper. And just a reminder, audio listeners, I'm holding it up again. We've got a beautiful hardcover of Flight or Fright, edited by Stephen King and Bev Vincent, gracious, graciously given to us by Richard Schismar. So thank you for uh, joining us today, Bev. Brennan, as always, thank you for being my co-host. And listeners, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for choosing us. <laughs>